Welcome to the revision lecture on consumer behavior. In this lecture, we're going to go over the lectures, the previous lectures that we've already had, with the view of building connections and relations between concepts in those lectures. What we're doing here is we're looking for integration between the different lectures that we had so far. Here is the outline of today's lecture. Firstly, we will look at marketing strategy. This is what we began this course with, with the link between marketing strategy and consumer behavior. The reason this is important is because we want to be able to apply consumer behavior towards marketing problems. And part of your quiz will be asking for that application. So we're going to revisit aspects of marketing strategy, revise how we can use those in order to apply consumer behavior specifically towards a brand or a product. Following this, we're going to look at the model of consumer behavior. And this is the crux of what you need to do in this course. You need to relate different lectures into a consistent model of consumer behavior. To do this, we're going to review lectures such as problem recognition, perception, preference formation, motivation, <coughs> attitude, and post-purchase behavior. We're going to do this with a view of building connections between those. So when we look at problem recognition, we'll think about perception. When we think about preference formation, we'll look at motivation and attitudes and post-purchase behavior. How do those integrate and connect? And in the final part of the lecture, we're going to look at the quiz, think about how we can build a model of consumer behavior how we can connect variables from different lectures into a consistent model, into a graphical model or representation of consumer behavior as a causal diagram, as a flow chart. At its very essence, marketing strategy is a process of matching what the company does well, its strengths, with understanding the customer's needs. Marketing strategy becomes what we call this moderating influence that takes what the organization has in terms of its resources and capabilities and turns, the, turns those into a competitive advantage. This moderating process here means that even though the organization has certain resources, depending on how it organizes those, how it applies strategy, it is able to achieve a competitive advantage or not. In order to apply marketing strategy, in this case, we need to understand what we do well. We need to understand the strengths of the organization. We also need to understand customers' needs. And this is the connection between marketing strategy and consumer behavior. We cannot gain a competitive advantage without understanding customers' needs. And consumer behavior is designed to allow us to understand the customer, their behavior, their needs, whether they're cognitive, emotional, or behavioral. Creating a competitive advantage is crucial because it leads to what we call a shareholder value. This is how shareholders and stakeholders value the organization. And if the organization provides a lot of value to the customer, it is also able to capture that value and grow. As it grows, it makes its investors rich and creates shareholder value in this process. So understanding how we can apply marketing strategy and how we can apply consumer behavior within marketing strategy to create competitive advantages is crucial. The critical focus of marketing strategy is going to be this idea of a competitive advantage. How can we develop and sustain a competitive advantage in the market? In order for us to be able to do this, we have to understand firstly what a competitive advantage is and how consumer behavior helps us develop a competitive advantage. So what is a competitive advantage? Well, we've defined a competitive advantage in relation to three key variables, in relation to utility, uniqueness, and no imitation. What do those mean? Utility means there is value. Consumers perceive value in whatever offering we're providing them, whether it's a product or a service. The consumer finds a potential value and a potential satisfaction in this product. When we think of utility, we have to think about lectures on consumer behavior that we've had. Since we're going to use consumer behavior to derive a competitive advantage, we have to know how utility is created. What do consumers consider to be utility and how it's experienced? This means this idea of utility brings a number of lectures together in order to be able to understand and manage this process of delivering utility to customers. One of the basic foundations of utility is in the lecture on preference construction. How consumers search and evaluate information about products, how they combine that information to create an estimate of value, determines utility. And their preferences reflect those judgments of utility. 
However, we cannot understand utility simply through information processing. We also need to go back to lectures on problem recognition and customers' needs. Desired and actual states are also related and relevant. We also need to bring in information from post-purchase. How do consumers experience utility and how is utility related to satisfaction itself? In the lecture on post-purchase effects, we describe satisfaction as the experience of utility as a result of changes in actual states relative to desired states of consumers. So in order for us to deliver value for consumers, we have to understand how consumers process and understand information in relation to preference construction. We may also need to understand preference formation. How do consumers, over a period of time as they use the product, develop stable judgments of utility and preferences? And how do those relate to consumers' desired and actual states, how they change and develop over time so we can manage the consumer's experience over a period of time? However, delivering utility or value to customers is not sufficient. If everybody else in the market, if all our competitors are able to deliver exactly the same value for the customer, then there is no differentiation. The customer doesn't really have to buy from us, they can buy from anybody else and they will still get exactly the same product, the same value, the same utility. In that setting, the customer is not really interested in the attributes of our product because those attributes may be the same everywhere and they all deliver exactly the same value to the customer. The only thing we might be able to compete on is price at that stage and that becomes a highly hyper-competitive market, a perfect competition where prices are driven to marginal costs because of lack of differentiation. So in marketing, we're always looking for this point of difference. We're looking to create unique value for customers, not just create something that customers will want and value, but also something that's unique in the market that no one else has. And by creating a unique value, we can develop a competitive advantage because at that point, if the consumer actually wants that specific value that we provide, there is a lot less competitors. They have to buy from us to get that specific value that gives us an advantage over competition. Where does uniqueness come from? How do consumers understand that a product is different or unique? And the foundational lecture for uniqueness here is obviously perception. We understand how perception forms, what's the perceptual process, how do consumers contrast against foreground and background information, how do they notice just noticeable differences between products, and how does change and contrast and reference points determine the consumer's ability to judge that our product is different or unique. However, uniqueness and perception is not the only lecture that's relevant here. When we think of lectures on preference construction, how do consumers search and find information, if they are able to look at and find actually the unique bits of information that we provide versus what everybody else shows, then the search process in itself and the evaluation process can be shifted towards the consumer understanding that there is a unique value in this proposition. So lectures on perception are going to integrate with lectures on preference construction. Not only is unique value relevant, but we also need to prevent competition from copying and imitating what we do. Because as soon as we develop a unique advantage, as soon as we create value for the customer and customers begin buying from our company and switching, competitors are not going to sit there and lose market share they will notice that there is something new, there is something different, something that consumers value. They don't want to lose customers, they don't want to lose sales, they will do everything they can to imitate and copy. In many respects, it's sometimes difficult, especially in globalized markets, to prevent imitation. There are some jurisdictions that provide strong protections for intellectual property, but there are other jurisdictions that have far less protection for intellectual property and information spreads is copied and refined and we find competitors coming from different directions that we cannot even anticipate. So how can we use our understanding of consumer behavior to help us build barriers to imitation? The foundational lecture for this process of preventing imitation focuses on the dynamics, focuses on preference formation. If consumers develop long-term and stable preferences for a product, if they develop brand loyalty, then these consumers are much less likely to switch to imitating brands. So what we're looking at is a process of repeated reinforcement, repeat, reinforcement of behavior and re reinforcements of attitudes.
in a process of post-purchase effects where we not only sell the product to the customer but we also use the post-purchase process to build brand loyalty. So again we have a number of lectures coming in to intersect at this idea of no imitation. We look at lectures on preference formation, we look at lectures on attitude change, and we look at lectures on post-purchase effects. The reason this is going to be relevant because in your quiz there is going to be an application part to the question. And that application asks you, how can you launch a specific brand of a product? An example might be something like this. You know, I think you're a marketing manager. You've been tasked with launching a new iPad Pro, a derivative of the iPad for the professional business consumer. How will you position the product and manage its launch over time? This is a related problem that you will encounter in your quiz for. And in the quiz, you will need to describe how your model of consumer behavior allows you to manage a launch of a product. So the first question you need to ask yourself, what do we need to achieve with the launch of a product? And that will be positioning. We need to position the product in the consumer's mind relative to competition. Then how do we position it? Well, we position it on the competitive advantage. So this is what we need to achieve through our model of consumer behavior. And then we can bring in different components of our model that relate different lectures together to achieve utility, uniqueness, and no imitation. And once we create these three aspects and they all interact at the same time, at that point, we're going to develop a competitive advantage. So in the application part of the quiz, make sure that you have a very good understanding of the early lectures on marketing strategy. Well, you may not have a lot of information about the customers themselves just from the quiz question. What you can do is you can make certain assumptions just simply from what the brand of the product is. And you can state those assumptions. Once you state those assumptions, you can build your description of the application part. Remember, in marketing strategy, we position on the competitive advantage. We position on utility, uniqueness, and preventing imitation. We do this for a specific segment of customers where we have strengths and we can actually do this. So the company often chooses its customers, but in order to be able to choose a certain segment of customers, we have to understand the segmentation across the market. So by stating your assumptions and making a, a brief justification of a target market, you will be able to outline how you position your product and how your model of consumer behavior helps you do this. To understand where utility comes from and how we generate utility as the first attribute of the competitive advantage, we're going to start with the lecture on problem recognition. We're going to look at how process of problem recognition can be related to dynamics of utility that we discussed in other lectures. Now we start this idea of problem recognition with a desired state. This is this ability of consumers to imagine what they don't have, to put themselves in the future mentally through imagination and think about how different and how good their life could be if they had other products, if they had other experiences. Desired states are the foundational concept of this idea of utility and a, and a foundational concept of consumer behavior. As soon as the consumer perceives a contrast between a desired and an actual state, when an actual state is the customer's perception of what they already have and their estimate of how well their life is doing at this particular point in time. When a consumer can see a difference between what they have and what they can imagine, between the desired and the actual states, the customer develops a need. A need is this state of tension that stretches this rubber band of at one end desired at the other end actual state. How do we link lectures with this basic concept of actual and desired states that leads to a need? Or well, we can think about desired states as being constructed over a period of time as the consumer gathers information and evaluates that information. So this is the process of preference construction. The consumer looks forward develops hypotheses about different products and links those in the hierarchy of goals and desired state. In relation to actual states, the consumer's perception becomes relevant because consumers judge their actual states 
in relation to reference points, in relation to other products, in relation to how they see those and what information they have. So just in the definition of the need itself, the difference between actual and desired states, we already see a combination of lectures coming in, provide information, justification, what these are and how these can be affected. We also know that there is a feedback effect from needs to perception. And so problem recognition requires the consumer to be aware of a need. And when we talk about awareness, we naturally bring ideas of attention ideas of perception. And if we want to focus consumers on a specific need, we can use perception to highlight aspects of actual states or, aspect, or aspects of desired states, highlight the differences between those so the need seems larger. We also know that needs are related to motivation because there is this state of tension that's generated by the difference between actual and desired states, this psychological state of tension. It generates a drive for consumer to do something about it. Consumers are motivated to remove this state of tension, so it's drive reduction process. And as they become aware of a need, they also become aware of the need to do something about this. And this takes us into the dynamics of utility, dynamics of need. As actual states appreciate over a period of time, if a consumer has, for instance, a car, the car will be great when it's new, but over a period of time, it obviously depreciates, it begins to break down, it doesn't work as well, and the consumer notices a change. It, it no, they notice a change from where, where they really want their car to be as a new, shiny, reliable car to what they now have after a few years, which is a sort of a dirty, banged up car that doesn't always start. So the difference between actual states and desired states can grow naturally as products depreciate. Marketers quite often can focus consumers' awareness on this process, and they can focus them on this process by suggesting that the actual state that they have and pointing out faults and that it doesn't work as well. Well. As consumers are motivated to act, they go and purchase a product. As they have purchased the product, the actual state begins to rise and get closer to a desired state. If the product functions as the consumer assumes that it will improve their actual state towards the desired state, the consumer reduces the need. And that need reduction leads to the process of dynamics. As actual states vary, they depreciate and they appreciate through consumption and use of products, consumers' needs go up and down, creating dynamics of need. And, as, and through this process, motivation also increases and wanes. Moreover, because consumers' perceptions are relative, desired states themselves can change. So consumers' preferences can drift over a period of time as they develop new ideas, as they learn other ways of doing things as they imagine the future to be different. So desired states themselves can change. You may have a phone, let's say. it's a You buy a new Android phone or you buy a new iPhone and it's great. You're happy with it for about six months. It's the latest phone on the market and everybody looks at your phone, they're interested in its features, etc. until a new phone comes up. At this point, the desired state changes. If your desired state is to have the latest technology and then now the there is another phone on the market. Even though the phone that you have at the moment works perfectly, all its features are just as they were six months ago when you were really happy with it, now your desired state has changed, your reference point has changed because now there is a product with other features, newer features. And when you desire the novelty of the latest features, your desired state will create a different reference point and that will generate a need as well. In this sense, what we get is this process of need dynamic. As actual states depreciate or as desired states change, we get an increasing state of tension, an increasing state of difference between actual and desired states that generates this level of tension. It also generates motivation to act. And once consumer engages in behavior and consumption, actual states get closer to desired states and we get a reduction in this state of need, state of tension. And over a period of time, the need could come back again. It gives us a process of need dynamics as need arise and subside and arise again. We also discussed this idea of optimum states of arousal, that when one need is decreased, it creates an opportunity for consumer to switch to consuming something else. Another need may take place. Once you have bought that latest phone, you're no longer in the market, but you still are looking for this experience of satisfaction. So consumers go through life looking for experiences. This optimal state of arousal suggests an optimal state of experience. If you have everything 
you need at this point in time and there is no other desired states for you to chase and achieve, your life will be comfortable but you will lack satisfaction. What we know about satisfaction from the lecture on post-purchase effects is that satisfaction results from changes in actual state, whether the actual states are getting closer or further away from desired state. When we get closer, we experience satisfaction. When we get further away, we experience dissatisfaction. This obviously links with the lecture on motivation, where we describe different types of motivation and also different types of emotion, how they relate to goals and desired states and consumers' behavior. And we described emotion, which is this experience of a motivational state, is the relation between behavior and desired state. We described it as a control process that keeps the consumer focused on a desired state, channels their behavior towards it. So the idea of problem recognition itself and how it links with li- with need dynamics brings in information from a variety of lectures and integrates it together. So your understanding needs to be a synthesis of all those lectures and of all that information. You will need to be able to explain the specific relations. You will need to be able to take things from different lectures to explain parts of problem recognition, for instance. So in the quiz, when you discuss problem recognition as part of your model. You have to be able to define it. You have to be able to state that problem recognition is the customer's awareness and recognition of a need state. You will need to be able to describe what the variables are in this this part of your model where problem recognition occurs. You will need to know desired states, actual states. You will need to know about perception and awareness, how that integrates. You will need to know about motivation, behavior control systems, emotions. You also will need to know about timing and need dynamics how those change over a period of time. This means that your model of consumer behavior becomes engaged almost fully simply to answer a basic question about problem recognition. This is the reason we want you to create a model of consumer behavior that is a synthesis of different lectures. Because in order to understand any aspect of consumer behavior, you need a broad synthetic uh, synthesis of understanding. And moreover, always bring your understanding, your conceptual understanding of consumer behavior to marketing and application. So give examples. Give examples of how you can use problem recognition to generate value, to potentially create uniqueness, and how to defend the market and stop imitation from competitors. We can link problem recognition with the idea of a perceptual process to come up with what we can describe as problem representation. This is how the consumer perceives a specific need that they might have. When we bring perception into the equation, we're looking at a process of exposure, attention, integration, and interpretation. These were the variables we discussed in relation to perceptual process. We already know that problem recognition requires awareness. So what is awareness? Well, awareness will be the first part of a perceptual process. Consumers can become aware of something simply by exposure, paying attention to it, and integrating that information. They know they're looking at a particular aspect. When we combine awareness with interpretation, the consumer represents a problem in a specific way. They represent a need in a particular way. This is the consumer's elaboration on that specific problem. So for instance, you might be hungry. There might be a need. There may be a difference between your actual and desired states and you perceive that as hunger. How you interpret that need will determine a lot of your behavior. If you interpret that need as something really averse and threatening and you really need to have food, you'll be much more motivated. If you interpret that hunger as you're doing fasting and fasting is good for you, for instance, it helps with health benefits, you'll have a very different response. So interpretation and representation of a problem frames consumers' behavior. So it's not only that consumers pay attention to the difference between actual and desired states and they are aware of the fact that they have a need but interpretation brings in the higher regions of the brain to either veto or help us initiate behaviors this creates a link with the idea of the dual circuit model so not only do we have perceptual processes that are fairly automatic but we also have the involvement of higher regions of the brain the neocortex in interpreting information and creating representations. And what we have argued in the lecture on perception is that consumers act on their interpretations. They act on the representation of the problem on the perceptual world.
So you will need to be able to use this information for marketing purpose. You will need to be able to discuss how you could apply and use the perceptual process to influence consumers' problem representation, for instance. That will be an aspect of launching that brand in the quiz, for instance. You will need to know the variables. You will need to know exposure. How can we achieve exposure? But exposure is not simply putting things in front of the consumer. To understand exposure, you have to understand consumers' information search. You, you have to understand whether consumers are doing this passively or on an ongoing basis. That gives you a hint that there is already a link between lecture on perception and this idea of exposure and preference construction where we discussed information search. You also need to understand attention. How can you capture, hold and divert attention? What we noticed and what we discussed in consumer behavior is that attention is often given to things that create a point of difference, that are different to what the consumer expects to see. So attention often goes towards uniqueness, things that stand out and are different from the background. So again, when you're thinking about capturing attention, you're thinking about how the consumer's overall nervous system responds to information and how it integrates with consumers' models of what the world is like. And if there is a conflict, if there is a difference between what the consumer expects or what the consumer thinks the world is like and what they see as the data coming in, that focuses attention. You will need to understand integration of information and gestalt principles and interpretation, how associations are formed. So interpretation is not simply part of the perceptual process, but at that point, it clearly links with other lectures. It links with lectures on information evaluation, which is preference construction. It li links with lectures on past information, because consumers not only evaluate information simply based on the data that they get, information coming in, what's in front of them, but also they link it with everything else they know from the memories and the associative model. So as information comes in, it activates memories and past experiences. So these associations become relevant in how consumers develop perceptual interpretation. We quite often see what we expect to see and what we have learned to see. So these interpretations bring information from lectures on preference formation and learning as well. And always think, how can we use this from a marketing perspective? How can a perceptual process be applied to aspects of preference construction, formation, and any other part of a product launch that might be relevant. When we connect problem recognition with perception, we're getting to the point of problem representation. And what we have been arguing in the lecture on perce perception is that consumers act on their perceptions. They don't act on the world itself. They act on the world that is perceived. And that's the world that's behaviorally important. So consumers' perceptions are critical. The marketers spend a lot of time trying to understand consumers' perceptions, but also to affect and influence those perceptions because we understand how attention shifts, how, can it be, how attention can be manipulated. So when we think about preference construction and how consumers develop their preferences and how they develop those preferences over time in a process of preference formation, we're in a situation where the consumer is essentially looking for a product attribute that will best remove their problem, that will best remove that state of tension, which is a need, and sat satisfy the customer, create this reinforcing experience of satisfaction. We understand that consumers judge utility on a number of dimensions. They can create different utility judgments simply based on the information they're able to find and perceive how they evaluate that information, but also if, over a period of time, how, how their experience of that information is reinforced. So we have a connection in terms of utility in relation to preference construction, preference formation, perception, problem recognition. It becomes a compound and a complex variable when we discuss utility because it brings in a lot of information from different lectures for us to really understand we, what utility is, where it comes from, and how can, it, how can it be managed over a period of time. In the quiz, be prepared to relate your information about utility and preference construction, preference formation, 
to a marketing problem. Think about how you can aid consumers, how you can affect consumers. So the model of consumer behavior creating is not only descriptive, it's a model where you as a marketer can go in and you can affect things like external search, internal search, amount of search, learning, memory, decision rules. How can you aid those processes? How can you affect those processes? Because as a marketing manager that understands consumer behavior, and if you're able to affect consumer behavior better than your competition, you gain a competitive advantage through this process. And we know motivation is linked to other lectures. We already know that the state of arousal, the state of tension is generated through desired and actual states, which creates a drive. That drive is to remove that state of tension. And also, it is a drive to keep us within an optimum level of arousal. Too much is no good and too little is also not, not ideal. Think about the components of motivation and how motivation can be affected. We have intrinsic, we have extrinsic, and we have habitual processes that are involved in motivation. When we think about intrinsic motivation, we're thinking about desired states, we're thinking about actual states. When we think of extrinsic motivation, we're thinking about reinforcement and satisfaction. We're thinking about operant conditioning processes, and those can lead to habitual behaviors. So when you're relating motivation to other parts of this course. When you're relating that through your model, you're looking at this idea of a drive. And if a drive represents a need state, that gives you a hint of how you can actually describe motivation in your model. You don't need a variable called a drive. That's a compound variable. If a drive is intrinsic, and that intrinsic part of motivation simply requires a difference between actual and desired states, those are the variables that you include in your model, and the drive itself can simply be described as part of this process of the growing or shrinking difference between actual and desired states. We have this idea of habitual learning and reinforcement processes. Your model could have feedback effects. As consumers consume, uh, as they use products, they change actual states, and as actual states get closer, to desired states, there is a perceived change, and that change is in the direction of the desired state, so consumer experiences satisfaction. Satisfaction in itself is a in extrinsic reward, it's an experience, and that experience of reward over a period of time establishes and reinforces a behavior. So having feedback effects in your model allows you to describe both learning and habitual aspects of motivation. In relation to actual states and the dynamics, you can also describe the process of external incentives and satisfaction. You can describe how those external incentives help the consumer develop satisfaction. Pay attention to some of the more nuanced variables that we discussed in relation to need dynamics. Things such as performance thresholds, optimal arousal, need dynamics, and feedback effects over time. When we discuss emotion, the lecture on emotion is also integrated across various lectures that we had. We start emotion through a stimulus, which is something external that comes in, and through perception and attention, the consumer understand there is a need state. In the dual circuit processing model, we suggested that consumers can react in an affective response emotionally through the limbic system and, and the amygdala, as well as through the neocortex process. And the two are related, they're not separate. But what this allowed us to do is say consumers can have parallel reactions. They can think of a product in one way and they can also feel about a product in a certain way. A consumer can have an emotional reaction and a cognitive reaction. The two integrate and, are, and inform each other. So when we think about preference construction, where we looked at a lecture specifically on information search, evaluation and decision roles, that was a very cognitive process. That was a very neocortex process. When we looked at the lecture on attitudes, we brought emotion into this process as well. And we suggested that the neocortex is also involved in moderating emotions and emotions inform cognitions. And given that emotions are an experience of a motivational state, so a motivational state would be this 
level of arousal that is generated, but through an appraisal process, through a process of cognitively framing what this level of arousal actually means, consumers experience emotions and consumers phrase and appraise and frame information about emotions in relation to their desired states. And as we frame those emotions in that way, as we appraise them that way, cognitively, we can create specifically specific types of feelings such as love, joy, anger, fear. So the cognitive processes that we understand and how consumers evaluate information are also relevant in understanding how consumers develop specific experiences of emotion. Again, not only describe what emotion is and where it comes from and how it relates to different lectures, but also be able to use emotions in influencing consumer behavior. And the variables that become relevant in this process are aspects of arousal, sensory stimulation, motivation. How do you manage a process of arousal over a period of time? What are the dynamics that develop from from this process. When consumers experience emotions, how does interpretation, how does evaluation, how does cognition affect this process? And think about expression. How can you create situations that allow consumers to express their emotions so that the higher regions of the brain, the neocortex, do not veto the behavioral intentions generated through emotion, that consumers are free to experience and express their emotion. Moreover, be able to link emotions with lectures on post-purchase effects such as brand loyalty. As consumers experience satisfaction, as consumers experience changes in actual and desired states, those changes in actual and desired states not only relate in what we call satisfaction, but they also generate emotions and feelings. Because as consumers bring their actual state closer or, or further away from a desired state, that in itself generates experience and feeling of emotion as consumers interpret that process. And we know that these processes of post-purchase feelings and effects and satisfactions lead to brand loyalty. So be able to link brand loyalty with emotion. When we think about attitudes, we think about a relatively stable responses. So whereas the emotion can arise very quickly and subside also quickly, attitudes persist over periods of time. Attitudes persist over months or years. You can have a favorable attitude towards a brand or a product. You may like a particular brand of a car. You may have a favorable attitude towards a Ferrari or a BMW. Whereas an emotion would be an immediate response to getting into one of those cars, an attitude persists over a period of time. An attitude be becomes an integrative construct. It combines cognition, our ability to search and evaluate information. It combines affective responses. But it's got more than this. It also relates habitual processes and learning, as well as the ability to express emotions and intentions in social situations. So attitude becomes this part of behavior control mechanism. It brings in information from various aspects of consumer behavior that we studied. And it also allows us to predict behavior, predict intentions to behave. And by understanding attitude change, we can understand potentially changes in behavior. What was important in the lecture on attitudes was how these hierarchies of effects, whether cognitive, affective, and behavioral, influence consumers' attitudes, and how can we link those with specific feedback effects. So we noted that consumers' cognitive evaluations and processing can lead to emotions because cognitions appraise certain levels of arousal and they generate effective emotional responses. And those emotional responses are quite often closely associated with approach and avoidance behaviors. So there is a hierarchy of effects. You can start with cognition, move to affect and behavior. But we also noted that this process can start at any stage. So the hierarchy of effects could be an emotional process. The consumer experience some emotion and then they go back to post justify their behaviors. And as a result, they develop attitudes. Or even consumer starts with a behavior itself with little or no justification for the effort. And then they post-rationalize to develop attitudes through this process. So you have to be able to understand attitudes from various perspectives and be able to use and apply those in various situations, whether it's behavioral, cognitive, and effective. So when we think about feedback effects that we discussed in the lecture on post-purchase, such as dissonance effects, 
what is the link to attitude? We know that attitude change relies on a system of rebalancing. If there is a cognitive dissonance, that means there is some kind of imbalance between what the customer has done and thought. Now, these processes can lead to further development of attitudes. For instance, if consumers buy products with little or no justification of, they, they buy products that are closely connected or, or closely matched by com competing products, consumers can experience dissonance. And how you resolve that dissonance, how you help the consumer get over that dissonance can lead to an improvement in attitude, a polarization of the attitude where consumers took up the, the product, they become a fan of the product to justify their ownership of that product. Think about how this process of preferences through learning and preference formation is influenced by feedback effects, as well as how these dynamic processes over time can lead to brand loyalty and how brand loyalty can be simply behavioral, where a consumer just habituates to buying a product versus affective, where a consumer has strong emotional connections and attachments with the brand. Think about how using a product changes the actual state. Think about this as a process of dynamic and those dynamics generate feedback effects. Be able to understand that satisfaction is an experience of utility and satisfaction relates to changes. It relates in consumers' perceived changes in actual states. Emotions are very closely related to this idea of satisfaction. This gives you a hint that emotions are also going to be related and they're going to be generated through changes in actual states. If actual states get closer to desired states, positive emotions are perceived. If actual states get away from desired states, negative emotions are perceived. So this is the problem of appraisal and emotional responding. So satisfaction and emotion responding are going to be integrated and linked. So we have a basic representation of customers' experience, customers' needs, how those needs relate to motivation, how motivation leads to behavior, and how the hierarchy of effects becomes a dynamic process over a period of time leading to need dynamics, feedback effects, attitudes, preferences and learning and brand loyalty. As with the other parts of consumer behavior, you're not only looking to understand those and how they relate across lectures, but also how to apply them. Think about variables such as usage, purchase, maintenance, disposal. How are those related to behavioral feedback effects? How do those influence satisfaction? And how does responsiveness to customers' needs build trust and brand loyalty? Be able to describe those in functional terms that marketers can use and influence. We are going to use an example of attitude, the basic model of attitude that we have, to explain the basic variables that we can use to build a model of consumer behavior. Now, please note that what I'm showing you here is just an example. So this is not the model of consumer behavior. This is just a example that we had to represent attitude. Your model is going to be much more complex and much more detailed. But what this simple diagram that you've already seen helps us do is define and give names to specific variables that you're going to use to build your model of consumer behavior. It helps us understand the process of drawing this flowchart. So in the first instance, what we're going to have is what we call independent variable. When you're drawing a model, when you're drawing a causal flowchart, it's going to be some variables that begin the process process. They may not depend on anything else. In this instance, we started the model of attitude by saying there is cognition, affect, there are social norms, habits, and incentives. And those are the variables that we thought a marketer could potentially influence. Now, in your model of consumer behavior, these may not be the specific variables that you call independent variable. But here, just for the illustration purpose, we're going to say, what, are, what is an independent variable? An independent variable is one that begins the process. It doesn't depend on a lot of others. We also have this concept of a mediator. So a mediator is a variable in the middle. It's a link in the chain. If we want to get to behavior from cognition, in this specific model, the causal chain flows through intention. And if you remove intention, if you break that chain, you do not get to behavior. This is what a mediator means. So as you create your model of consumer behavior, think about which are the independent variables. Think about which will be your mediating variables or mediators. We also have variables that we call moderators. And moderators change the strength of the causal relation here between any two variables. The convention is that we draw moderators as a perpendicular arrow to that connection. What this means, this 
perpendicular arrow because it doesn't go to the variable itself it just goes to the connection between those variables it says that that connection somewhat depends the strength of that connection varies and depends on something else so whether a consumer goes from an intention to behavior probably depends on their budget right so if i really like ferrari and i really have an intention if someone would ask me would you buy a ferrari i'd say yes but i don't buy a ferrari right the only reason i don't buy a ferrari is because i don't have the cash so budget constraint means that whether this link is affecting behavior depends on whether the consumer has actually got the budget. When we think about demand, demand is not just a need, but it's also the ability to satisfy that need. So we have described some basic variables, independent variables that don't depend on anything else, mediating variables. We can't influence those directly, but we influence those indirectly from the independent variables. We have moderators that change the strength of that relationship, and we can put moderators on any causal link as you build your model. And finally, we have an outcome, something that we want the consumer to do. This is the output of our model. Keep in mind those names. Keep in mind the idea of independent variables, because independent variables are going to be the ones that a marketer can affect. So for your model to be applicable to consumer behavior and also to marketing strategy, you need the marketer to be able to influence some of these. There may be variables that a marketer you think cannot influence, but those variables are essential in getting an outcome. So those will be the mediating variable, and you need those variables in your model. And also, you can think that some of these connections may not always work, but it may work depending on influence of something else. So rather than budget, maybe this could be attention or some other psychological variable. Moderators can be anything else. These are the building blocks of your model of consumer behavior. We're going to look for inputs into the process, which will be the independent variables, variables that we can influence and change, and how those variables lead to an output. We're going to look at indirect variables, which are in the middle, the links in the chain, we call those mediators. And we're going to look for moderators, how they change the strength of the relation. When you draw your flowchart, when you develop your model, try to evaluate your model, try to evaluate whether the model satisfies two aspect. Firstly, the value of any model or any theory is in its ability to describe a phenomenon, but also to predict observable outcomes. So your model needs to be able to explain how consumers react, how consumers behave, how consumers think. So your model needs to be descriptive on the different types of lectures that we had. It needs to be able to describe emotion, it needs to be able to explain motivation, preference, construction, preference formation. All the other lectures need to be able to be described within your model. So your model will be a comprehensive description. But more than this, your model needs to predict outcomes. It needs to predict what a marketer can do, how the marketer can intervene, influence an outcome. If there is a change in any of the variable variables in your model, can that change be influenced by marketing or is that change influenced by something else? When those changes occur in the model, if those variables are altered, what is the observable outcome? In this way, you're able to link your model with marketing strategy. One of the outcomes of marketing strategy will be that launch and positioning of the product on the competitive advantage. When building that model and trying to find its application to marketing strategy. Think about deliverables, which are essentially the outcomes you want to achieve. Maybe it's you something like you want the consumer to choose a specific product or a brand. Maybe a specific segment of the market you want them to choose or buy this product. Or maybe you simply want them to develop an attitude or an emotional response. Or maybe you want them to become brand loyal. Think about what are the deliverables. Some of those deliverables will be determined by the need of marketing strategy to develop a competitive advantage. Once you understand that the deliverables from your model, think about what you can control, what are the controllables, and this is where marketing comes into your model. This is where marketing strategy allows the manager to use the model and make it effective and influential. So think about information search and evaluation. What do we know about information search, how consumers search for information? What do we know about evaluation, how they change their evaluation rules? Can those be controlled or influenced? What about effective reactions? What about the process of appraisal? And what about personality level segmentation? Can we actually affect personality? Is personality something we cannot affect? So think about what you can control, what you cannot control. And then think about what we call contingency factors. These are the moderating variables. The moderating Moderating variables will be the ones that change the relations between controllables and deliverables. The question in the quiz will ask you to launch a brand, 
or a product. It could be a smartphone, it could be anything else. But your approach should be similar. You make some assumptions about market segment and you focus on positioning the product on utility, uniqueness, and lack of imitation. How can you do this by your understanding of consumer behavior and the variables in your model? How does, for instance, personality comes into it? We can classify people as conscientious or extroverts. We can understand that some of these people potentially seek variety of have higher threshold for risk. Is that the group of customers we want to target? So when you make your assumption about a market segment, state how you're using your understanding of psychology to potentially describe what this market segment might be and why you're focusing on that specific market segment. And then think about uniqueness, think about utility, think about what's there about product in terms of its design that captures attention, that focuses consumers on uniqueness, how a particular attribute of a product might be used through the process of perception. So what can a marketer do? The marketer can change the product, the marketer can change the price, the marketer can change the communication and distribution of the product. So there are certain levers the marketer can pull. How do those levers then influence consumers' information processing through the model of consumer behavior that you have to result in this competitive advantage? And how does your model deal with long-term effects, effects over time? Can your model explain brand loyalty? Can your model explain emotional connections developing over a period of time? Can your model link process of behavioral learning with the process of establishing emotional attitudes? In this final lecture, we reviewed information from various previous lectures that we had. The review was focused on suggesting connections, how you can think about the relations between different lectures and different components of those lectures and different variables in those lectures. It suggested how information in this course is integrated and connected. So even though we presented that information for teaching purposes segregated into specific lecture topics, those topics of lectures quite often require understanding of other lectures and other topics and other variables in those under those topics for you to have a clear understanding of any one of those lectures. So this means this is an integrated process of consumer behavior and your job now is to build this model of consumer behavior. We give you a hint on how to link those variables to build an overall model of consumer behavior. And we also suggested on a very conceptual level how to draw a diagram. What are the independent variables? What are the dependent or outcome variables? What are the variables in the middle that we call mediators and how moderators affect? When you draw your model of consumer behavior, keep to those conventions. These are basically conventions that have been established in marketing research to allow us to understand graphical causal models. So use an arrow to represent a causal relation between any two variables. Try to understand which variables might be independent or which variables allow the marketer to control them or influence them. Think about the outcome variables. What are we trying to achieve from this process? Think about the mediating variables and those will be important in describing the psychology of the process and suggesting that you have a deep understanding of what goes on within this process. So to create a model that's comprehensive, you're going to have a whole range of mediating processes and variables in there. And think about how those processes interact through what we call moderating variables, that they change strength of any one causal relation. And make sure that your model is applicable, that your model is usable from a marketing perspective, that you can create competitive advantage and develop marketing influence through your understanding of consumer behavior. Thank you all for taking part in this course. My hope is that the information that was presented in these lectures and in the course and how it's been structured across the examples that tutors were asked to provide and the theory and the conceptual part that was given through the lectures and the assessments that integrated, that this information will become relevant for you, if not now, then at some point in the future. And when you look back at this course five or 10 years from now, what will remain with you is this model of consumer behavior, your ability to understand consumers because you spent time thinking and elaborating on how to build and develop this unique version of the model yourself. And through that process, the success of this course will not be simply the grade that you receive at the end of quiz four, but how much you can remember of consumer behavior a few years from now.